ago, and we were already endowed with this endocannabinoid system because it had been formed hundreds of millions of years before. And so there's a reason for that. And I'll show you a little bit about what that reason is or what those reasons are in just a second. But now fast forward to only 10,000 years ago. This is when the cannabis plant and the biological activity of these cannabinoids was starting to be known and, and used in many ways through religious use and health reasons and so forth. But it wasn't until the 1850s that the Western world actually started to understand the bioactivity of cannabis and the benefits that it can potentially have. But really, and one of the reasons even as a physician I had never heard of the endocannabinoid system is because it wasn't until the 1990s that Raphael Meshulam discovered the endocannabinoid system. So I went to medical school before the 1990s, and they never obviously taught it because it hadn't been discovered. And even for the last 15 years, there's not been a lot that has been understood about this endocannabinoid system. Maybe a lot of people here have heard about it, but most people have not, especially people who are not focused on cannabis and in, in the industry. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about this endocannabinoid system. I'll use the term ECS for short, so I don't have to say it as many times during this presentation. But basically, the ECS, this endocannabinoid system, is one of the major systems in the body, just like the cardiovascular system or the respiratory system or the digestive system. It's a major factor. And here's where I'm going to try to simplify it a little bit. It primarily involves two different receptors cannabinoid receptor type 1, which we call CB1, and cannabinoid receptor type 2, which we call CB2. Now, one of the misconceptions about marijuana and cannabis is, is the issue of psychotropic effects. Well, there's really only one molecule primarily that has psychotropic effects, and that's the CB1 molecule, uh, the THC molecule that binds to CB1 receptors. These CB1 receptors are found mostly in the brain, and they're throughout the brain and have certain effects. But if you don't want that effect, then other molecules in the cannabis plant can bind to the CB2 receptor, which does have no psychotropic activity, doesn't give a buzz. And I'll explain a little bit more about this in just a little bit as we talk about the health and therapeutic opportunities here. But basically, the way you can think about these receptors is a lock and key. For those of you who don't know what receptors are, they're basically a type of, of, of lock that some molecule, the key, will fit into. And when that happens, it unlocks the physiologic potential or biologic activity that that particular receptor is responsible for. So, for example, THC binds to the CB1 receptor in the brain and causes certain effects, not only the psychotropic effects, but it also has some health effects as well. CBN, another one of the molecules in the cannabis plant, binds to CB2. No psychotropic effects, but some health benefits. CBD, one of the most studied and, and, and abundant molecules, many of you have heard of it probably, in the cannabis plant, doesn't actually bind to either one, but it has effects on the ECS, the endocannabinoid system, in indirect ways. So what I'm going to do as we go through this talk is help you understand, number one, the interaction with these receptors and how they affect health and physiology and well-being, but also how we can take it to the next step to create drugs that actually treat diseases. The endocannabinoid system is throughout the body. I mentioned CB1 receptors are primarily in the brain. CB2 receptors are primarily in the periphery, in the immune system, and in the digestive system and elsewhere. But in healthy people, they're very well regulated. They, our bodies form cannabinoids itself, and it binds to these receptors and creates balance. But in dysfunctional endocannabinoid systems, this can create disease. And now we're learning that this is partly the cause of some of these diseases, and now how we can treat those diseases. As I mentioned, our bodies produce cannabinoids. The, uh, so these are substances that are produced by our body, so they're called endo, hence endocannabinoid, and they are for different purposes, to create balance primarily in the body. And uh, anandamide was the first endocannabinoid that was discovered, and it's actually also found in chocolate. So I guess some people get bliss from chocolate because that's what one of the, uh, the outcomes of binding to this particular endocannabinoid. There have been other endocannabinoids that have been discovered, and as I mentioned, that these endocannabinoids interact with the body's ECS to produce certain results. And basically the result is to create 
what we call in the medical profession homeostasis or physiologic balance. If something is out of balance in our body, whether that's inflammation or neurodegeneration, this endocannabinoid system tries to create balance and get it back to normal. But it can't always do that effectively, especially when it's diseased. It has more receptors than any other system in the body, so that means it definitely has some importance. This deficiency syndrome that, that I mentioned could have a direct relationship to creating diseases, and most doctors still don't even know about that. So education of physicians first is one of the big efforts that we need to undertake. And as I mentioned, again, I'm going to say this probably a few times just so it's very clear, and again, most of you probably already know this, but THC is really the only molecule, one molecule in the cannabis plant that creates the psychotropic effects that a lot of people associate with using marijuana. And so if they bind, if these molecules bind to the CB2 receptors, there are no psychotropic effects. So how can the ECS be affected? I've already talked a little bit about these endocannabinoids, cannabinoids that are found in our, that are produced in our body. Phytocannabinoids, we're all familiar with, that's from plants, so it comes like in the marijuana plant, the cannabis plant, THC and CBD are examples of phytocannabinoids. There can also be synthetic cannabinoids, and I'm going to give you some examples of those in just a few minutes that you'll find quite interesting, I believe. And then there are other natural products that are not cannabinoid, but that actually interact with the endocannabinoid system, and I'll show you some examples of that as well. I think it's very well established that there are lots of health benefits to cannabinoids. These are 10 different molecules in the cannabis plant, including THC, CBD, and others that are in the cannabis plant. Now, I'm going to take you through a process here, to a stepwise process, on how we can use these cannabinoid molecules, these cannabis molecules, for different purposes. Step one here, if you think about marijuana, you think about the plant, you think about potentially smoking it, or now there's edibles that you can get, but you're getting all the different molecules. And there are about 150 different cannabinoid molecules in the cannabis plant. Again, only one of those, THC, causes the buzz, the psychotropic effects, but all the other ones do not. So I'm going to talk first about what most people call or term medical marijuana. That's using the plant, essentially, with all of its components, all of its molecules. This will be step one. This are, these are the common medical conditions that are being treated or used for medical marijuana. The big one is pain, also anxiety, but there are a lot of other things. You can't read all the things on this list, but things like multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears, a lot of different things people are using medical marijuana for. And part of that is because it has such good effects. On the other side of the coin, one of the things as a physician that we are concerned about, especially here in the United States, is the opioid crisis. Millions of people are addicted to opioids right now, and many people die every year from opioid addiction and from the, the, the toxicities associated with that. Well, in states in the US where medical marijuana is legal, the use of opioids and prescription drugs is significantly lower, and the effects are significantly better for pain reduction, sleep, and anxiety, and other things. 25% reduction in fatalities in states that have medical marijuana legalized. And there are drugs that are a lot deadlier than marijuana. In this particular chart, you see no deaths related to marijuana, but we all know that tobacco kills a lot of people every year, and it's legal. Same with alcohol. So there's a misconception here that we need to understand from the standpoint of health, wellness, and even investment opportunity. Addiction rate is low, even using medical marijuana, a lot, which, which includes THC. I'll talk to you in a minute about just using CBD and the, uh, the, the potential for addiction there, which is essentially none. And then this is important as a physician, where in states where medical marijuana is legal, for pain, there are 1,826 fewer prescriptions per year per patient prescribed by doctors for these prescription drugs that could be harmful and addictive. So it's very dramatic, and patients feel the same way. This, this chart, I won't 
bore you with all the details, but basically patients like taking this better than taking opioids and other kinds of addictive, very harmful drugs. So going back to this medical cannabis treatment, we know that each of the molecules in the plant have health benefits. We know that. That's, that's given. We're going to find out a lot more about this over the coming years, but right now we know there are a lot of, a lot of advantages health-wise. Now the question is, do you take the plant with all the molecules, or do you, can you go with one specific molecule that has effects? And the answer is yes, for both. Uh, maybe you've heard of the term coined by the same guy who discovered the endocannabinoid system, Raphael Meshulam, the entourage effect, which may, means that sometimes, and it seems to be true in some cases, the combination of these molecules interacting with each other is more potent, more powerful, maybe even synergistic as compared to one molecule alone. So that's a great reason to use a combination of the molecules. But there's the other side of that coin, which is there are specific cannabinoid molecules like CBD that have profound effects on disease and on, on, on particular symptoms of diseases. Uh, Epidiolex, which is a CBD drug which was just approved by the FDA, GW Pharma's drug, has profound effects for children with seizures, for example, and that's just one of the molecules. Similarly, uh, my company, Emerald Health Pharmaceuticals, our, our molecule is in, in development, it's called EHP-101, it's a specific molecule which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. So let's take step two now, talk about specific molecules. We talked about the whole medical marijuana component. Now let's take it and say, okay, how about just using CBD? I just gave the example of GW Pharma, and they, they use CBD in their prescription drug. But here's what the World Health Organization said about CBD recently. They said there are no case reports of abuse or dependence relating to the use of pure CBD. No public health problems have been associated with the use of pure CBD, and CBD is generally well tolerated with a good safety profile. So that's good news because we can actually treat disease potentially, which we're now proving, with a good safety profile, unlike opioids. And there are a lot of diseases that this can deal with, from neurodegenerative diseases, inflammatory diseases, even cancer. And all of these diseases are being looked at as potential effects for CBD and other cannabis molecules. Epidiolex is the example I gave. I mean, think about it. I don't know if you've heard some of the, it's been in the news a lot, the, some of the stories of the, this is for, for certain types of childhood epilepsy. The, some of these kids are having hundreds of seizures every week. I've met a parent of one of these, these people, and they have no life. They take this drug, which is just CBD, remember, no buzz, no high, and their seizures are either gone or minimized to one or two a week, perhaps, and they're now functioning human beings. As a parent, I would certainly give my child something like this to treat seizures. And the global trend is, is, is telling. Uh, the red areas here are where, where it's still illegal, but that's getting smaller and smaller. Five years ago, most of this would be red, or a lot of it would be. Canada is definitely lead, leading the way, and I'll give an example of that in just a minute. But even the FDA has declared that CBD has benefit. So this indicates, if you're familiar with the scheduling of drugs, CBD is still considered a Schedule I drug, which means it has addictive potential, which we've already seen is not the case, and it has no medical benefit, which we've already seen is not the case. So there is a trend here for legalizing this and for good reason. And even Jeff Sessions, believe it or not, this was from the Mot Motley Fool uh, in April, and it's, he said, uh, it, the title of it is, you'll never guess what Jeff Sessions just said about marijuana. He's the weeds industry's biggest opponent, and it says, while being questioned, Sessions said, and I hope you're sitting down for this, there may well be some benefits from medical marijuana. So it's very clear that the trend is towards legalization. Once that happens, we're going to be able to, both from a, a health perspective, but also even from a recreational perspective, understand the opportunities. And I'll get into that in just a second as well. Lots of companies are now taking advantage and seeing the opportunity present in this. These are some of them. I've divided them into three different categories. Medical marijuana growers and suppliers pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies, and then others like nutraceutical companies and, and, and other research companies and so forth. 
I'll talk a little bit more about the investment opportunities here at the end, but for right now, you probably have heard of many of these companies, and some of them you probably have not. One of the big things for companies, especially companies like ours, which is Emerald Health Pharmaceuticals, is having patents in place. We can't patent the molecule of CBD or THC because that's a, a natural substance that's already known, but we can patent, and composition of matter patents are the most value driving, new chemical entities. In our company, Emerald Health Pharmaceuticals and uh, Nemus, which is another one of the Emerald companies, have composition of matter patents. We also are looking at type of disease patents. We have many diseases that we have patents on that we can treat with our molecules. And I'll talk about one example in just a few minutes. But let me take a step back. I've mentioned Emerald many times during this, so I want to give you an example of how this whole endocannabinoid system can be utilized in, from a business and a medical perspective, but also even from a recreational perspective. So Emerald Health Sciences is, 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 is the company that I work for, is Emerald Health Pharmaceuticals. They're our parent company, and I'll show you in a minute, there are a dozen companies involved in the Emerald family of companies, but Emerald Health Sciences is a global cannabis company, that investment company that's growing enterprises focused on developing the potential of cannabis and cannabinoids to enhance health and well-being. That's an important phrase, health and well-being, and I'll explain that in just a few minutes. The founder of the company, Emerald Health Sciences, our parent is Dr. Avtar Dillon. I've known Avtar for 23 years or so. He's a longtime friend and colleague, a very successful entrepreneur. And he, about four or five years ago, saw the vision to create this enterprise called Emerald Health Sciences and to pull together some of the greatest experts in the world to build this company and this family of companies. He, along with Jim Heppel, who they've known each other for decades as well, have done very many business things together. Gaetano Morello, who's a naturopathic physician, he went to high school with Avatar. They've known each other for 40 years. He's an expert in the field of naturopathic medicine. And then Puneet, Avatar's nephew, has also been CEO of public companies and is very experienced in, in his uh, realm. Our focus or our mandate or our principles at Emerald Health Science is, number one, comply with laws. We don't do anything that's not legal in the country. We have our headquarters in Canada for Emerald Health Sciences because it is federally legal there. My company, Emerald Health Pharmaceuticals, is US-based because we're working through the FDA process, which is totally legal. But we won't do anything that's not legal in any country. Secondly, we want to make sure everything is based in science. We want to make sure that science is the foundation and that we're doing everything scientifically. I'm a physician, Avtar, the founder of the company, is a physician. We have many PhDs and physicians in the company, and all of these people have experience and expertise. So we want to invest, incubate, and then innovate is how we look at our approach to doing this. So this is the Emerald family of companies. Emerald Health Sciences is the parent that's in the middle. We've got several companies, and what I'm going to do very quickly, just in a few minutes, is take you through some examples of how Emerald is nourishing this endocannabinoid system that I talked about and what opportunities there are for investment. The main three near-term investments in Emerald are these three. Emerald Health Therapeutics, which is a public company. This is based in Canada, and it is involved primarily in the medical and recreational components of cannabis and has, uh, is currently in, in building out about 1.1 million square feet of grow space, greenhouse space, to, to take care of the, the demand that's expected. Nemus Bioscience, I mentioned them, they're a public company in the US based in, in the LA area, and they're focused on patented cannabinoid drugs, and they plan to go into human clinical trials next year, primarily for ocular diseases like glaucoma. I'll, I'll give you a snapshot of what they do in a minute. And then the company I'm heading up is Emerald Health Pharmaceuticals, also patented cannabinoid new chemical entities, we're going to be going into human clinical trials within the next several weeks. So we're very excited about that. So let me start with Emerald Health Therapeutics. This is the company in Canada, public company. You can invest in it today on the Toronto Stock Exchange, primarily focused on plant genetics, large-scale agriculture, recreational, and medicinal products. I'm going to focus first on the medicinal side of things, and then I'll talk a little bit at the end about recreational. This was the eighth Canadian, licensed Canadian producer. Lots of expertise in this company. Lots of opportunity for growth, innovation. I mentioned 1.1 million square feet of greenhouse space being now uh, completed. 
and, and a lot more opportunity for up to 4 million square feet uh, later, and uh, a lot of opportunity for growth. These are the products that are currently being sold by Emerald Health Therapeutics. You see dried flower products, THC-based. You see cannabis oil, combinations of THC and CBD. Again, this is for medical purposes. So for people that need this for specific diseases, they get a prescription. This is federally legal in Canada, and this is all in Canada. And they have developed a whole product line and are developing more products as they move forward. Top-notch management team, Chris Wagner is the CEO of this company. He spent 10 years with Eli Lilly. He's launched multiple products, including major multi-billion dollar products, and a lot of expertise here. Again, that's one of the mandates, one of the, the criteria for Emerald Health companies is to have experienced leadership. The next company I'll talk about very briefly is the company I head up, which is Emerald Health Pharmaceuticals. And what we're doing is developing medicines based on cannabinoid science. And what that means is that we're looking at this endocannabinoid system. I've shown you this graphic a couple of times already. And we're looking only at the non-psychotropic activity effects. We don't want to have any psychotropic effects, any buzz or anything like that. And we're taking these and manipulating them chemically to create new chemical entities that take advantage of the CBD, the health benefits of CBD. As you can see, CBD has the most, the biggest list of health benefits. So we've taken CBD and now made it even better. And how do we do this? This is step three of this process. I've shown you the plant with all its molecules. I've shown you the CBD and how that can have an effect all by itself. But then if you change it just a little bit more and you take that and create a new patented molecule that has even better activity and broader activity, you can see that the structure is basically the same. This side chain has been added, so it's a little different than CBD. And then this part of the molecule has been changed a little bit. And that provides certain, talked about these receptors, the ability to bind to certain receptors that CBD alone can't do. And what does that do? That allows us to also get patents on these because they're new chemical entities. So they're non-psychotropic, they're synthetic, completely synthetic. We don't touch the plant. Even the CBD we start from is synthetically manufactured by a manufacturing operation in Germany. We have improved effectiveness. We've proven this in animal models. The potential to actually treat diseases. If I had multiple sclerosis, for example, I would definitely take CBD and it would help my symptoms. It's not going to cure my disease likely though. This has the potential, and I'll show you why, to potentially treat diseases. And we can patent them. So here's the molecules. We have eight issued patents, 26 pending patents, 25 different molecules, CBD derivatives and CBG derivatives. And we have protection out to 2037, so long patent protection. This is what creates value in a biotech company. And we're looking at four primary diseases to start with. Multiple sclerosis, scleroderma, Parkinson's disease, and Huntington's disease. The first compound, EHP-101, is the one that's going to start human trials in the next few weeks. So we've taken all the animal tests and done all the animal tests that are necessary, and I'll show you an example of those. But let me give you an example just of multiple sclerosis for, for uh, a good, good way to, to, to help you understand how this might be able to treat disease. Multiple sclerosis, if you don't know, is a disease of the nerves. There's a, there's a sheath around the nerves called myelin. The myelin sheath is important for nerve conduction. If that myelin is damaged, it's irreversible. And this is what multiple sclerosis, and it's progressive. Multiple sclerosis is a progressive destruction of the myelin sheath around these nerves. And when that happens, you get all the symptoms of MS, which is spasticity and the, and the, the tremors and all the pain associated with it. CBD alone cannot do anything to prevent the destruction of myelin or especially bring the myelin back. And what we're trying to do is do exactly that with this new molecule that's not THC, has no THC in it, has no other molecules, it's just focused on CBD, and it's just that change in that chemical structure that I mentioned that at, allows it to interact with different receptors. And this is where it gets scientific, but I'm not going to go through the science here. These receptors, P par gamma, CB2, and the HIF pathway, are responsible for neuroprotection, regeneration of neurons, and even myelination, that sheath around the nerves that I described that can't be brought back unless 
it is affected by some external source like this molecule. So most people say a picture is worth a thousand words. I think a video is worth a thousand pictures. So I want to show you how this acts in animal models. This is one of the models that is used, a validated model for multiple sclerosis. They, they induce multiple sclerosis into these mice, and then they either don't treat them, which is the control. This is the, an untreated animal you'll see first or they treat them with the molecule in question. Here, it's our molecule, EHP-101. So this is what happens when this animal has severe multiple sclerosis. You'll see it doesn't move around very quickly. The hind legs are dragging. It's not very curious. It doesn't even stand up, probably can't stand up, because it has severe MS. So what happens when we treat these animals, though, this is an animal that was treated with a relatively low dose, totally cured, totally normal. So this demyelination that occurred is now either prevented or reversed. And we're doing a lot of studies to test which one it is, and probably it's both. So dramatic example is why we're so excited. This is our management team at Emerald Health Pharmaceuticals. Decades of experience in the industry in developing drugs like this and bringing them to market. We're excited because we're getting into humans now. It's great to see animals react like this. We want to see humans get cured. And that's what we think we can do. I'll talk about Nemus very quickly. Another one of our emerald companies also has patented molecules that are synthetic. I mentioned they're about a year away from getting into the clinic, so sometime next year. Mostly for glaucoma, this is another analog or derivative of CBD and THC. And so they're, they're using it for glaucoma and ocular type uh, diseases that, that have no cure at this point. So again, very impactful from a, from a needed standpoint for medical use. Experience management team, Brian Murphy is, is brilliant. He's, he's been with big pharma, little companies, built companies on his own, and he's heading up as CEO of this company. Doug Cesario is their chief financial officer, been many years on the financial side. So again, strong management in all of these companies. Very quickly, Emerald Health Bioceuticals and Naturals. This is, I talked early on about some non-cannabis molecules that can actually affect the endocannabinoid system. So they're not found in the cannabis plant, but they're found in other things, things that you would know about. And they've already created this company, is a US-based company based in San Diego, just like ours. In fact, we share the same office space. And they're natural health, and they focus on using natural products to create products that address certain needs like calming needs, bliss, inflammation, sleep, better brain power. And they use things that you've heard of, ginger, echinacea, clove flower oil, magnolia, things that are non-cannabis but they affect the endocannabinoid system. And they're able to formulate this so that it can be patented as well. Again, great management team, Jade Butler, spent 25 years in building companies, natural product companies like this, to hundred millions of dollars and higher. I'll finish with Emerald Health Therapeutics. I mentioned them early on from the medicinal product perspective, and I'll tell you that when, even as a physician, and, and, and I used to be proud to say this, and now I'm a little embarrassed to say it, I'd never used cannabis in my life, never smoked pot. Thought it was, number one, it was illegal. Number two, I thought it would do something weird to me or whatever. Uh, and I thought that was great, but the more I learn about the endocannabinoid system and the health effects and the lack of toxicity effects, I'm now almost embarrassed to say I'd never used cannabis. And in fact, all the people in this room should be using some form of it because of the health benefits. So it took me a little while to wrap my head around the recreational component because it was all about health and medicine. But I said to myself, well, I drink alcohol. And that has no health benefits, just gives me a buzz, and it's a social thing. Unless you talk about red wine, maybe resveratrol having some antioxidant capabilities. But this is a recreational opportunity, and certainly from a business perspective, this is in Canada where it's about to be legalized in October for recreational purposes. Deloitte has said there's up to $22 billion in additional revenues that can come from the recreational component. So from a business perspective, it's definitely a value. From, a, from a, a, a health perspective or a social perspective, it has some value as well. And I'll, I'll close with that in just a second. So the summary here, 
just to wrap everything that I mentioned in the last 30 minutes, is that the ECS, the endocannabinoid system, exists throughout the body. It's there for a reason. And we're finding out those reasons now. And those reasons are powerful and they're healthy. And they can potentially treat diseases. There's the psychotropic effects of THC if they bind to CB1 receptors. There's the non-psychotropic effects of CB2. And then there's both. We've seen that in medical marijuana. You can choose to use both if you want, depending on the condition you're looking at. There are lots of health benefits to the individual molecules. There's lots of diseases that can be treated by these molecules. And as a physician, that's my commitment to make sure we're treating diseases and not hurting people. And I think this is one avenue to do that. The trend is for legalization, even here in the U.S. Even though the U.S. has been slow to, 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 to wake up to this, the trend is there. And so this in, in, invites and provides many investment opportunities. Victor Hugo said there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And Ron Paul followed that with an idea whose time has come cannot be stopped by any army or any force. And I think this is an idea whose time has come. So I invite you to think about the investment opportunities here. This is potentially a disruptive technology. Disruptive technology is an innovation that creates a new market and value network and eventually disrupts an existing market and value network, displacing established market leading firms, products, and alliances. We're already seeing big alcohol come into the cannabis space. Heineken just came into it three weeks ago. I just learned about that. But that's happening more and more. We see, we're going to see big pharma coming into this. We're, the, the Pfizer's and the J&J's of the world are going to want to have their finger into this. It's disruptive technologies like the automobile, penicillin, the internet. I think cannabis, marijuana could be one of these disruptive technologies from scientific and medical to recreational perspectives. Very broad opportunity. So these are the companies I showed you earlier that are in the space. You got the growers, the pharmaceuticals, and the others. Some of these who, companies who have been around a while are enjoying very large valuations and opportunities for investment. Canopy is the biggest grower, about a $10 billion valuation today. Aurora, $6 billion. Afria 2.5 and Kronos 1.8. Emerald, because we're starting now to really grow the business, is only at 500 million. So there seems to be a lot of upside there to catch up with some of these larger companies once we become the largest producer. Similarly, GW Pharma, $4.1 billion valuation, but they've now gotten product approval. Once some of these other com companies get product approvals, you can speculate that they will enjoy valuation similar. The company I head up, Emerald Health Pharmaceuticals, is still private. We're planning to do an IPO next year, and we're looking at a valuation right now of about $50 million based on our discussions with bankers and so forth. But you can see that Emerald is involved in all three spaces, whereas really not many of the other ones are. So we've got our, our hands in all pieces of the cannabis space. This is the chart of Canopy, the largest grower Five years ago, $2.59, now at $58.62. GW Pharma, the largest pharmaceutical company, five years ago at $8.92, now at $143.29. So significant upside in companies that in, are, are able to be invested in here. From a milestone perspective, this is what creates the value. EHT is fit, completing this 1.1 million square foot facility up in Canada. EHP, the company I work for, Initiating human studies, that's a big step for a biotech company and an IPO plan next year. Nemus, also planning to start clinical trials next year. And Emerald Health Bioceuticals, our nutraceutical company, looking to do a major deal with a large international grocery chain sometime soon. So the bottom line, I'll end with this slide. Uh, cannabis and the cannabinoids affect the endocannabinoid system. We know that. The endocannabinoid system provides balance and homeostasis, anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective, so it's healthy. There's health benefits. Medical benefits, the ability to treat deadly diseases that currently have no cure or even stop seizures in kids is extremely valuable. And we need to make sure we take care of that as well. Recreational, for those of you that are open to that, it might be a healthy social option for the future. And finally, investment. 
potentially a wealth building opportunity, investing in the right companies that have the upside for growth and value creation. So I thank you very much for your time today. And I definitely, if you want to contact us, my colleagues are in the room here, Bernie Hertel, Lita Garcia. And uh, we have a whole team of people either in Canada or in California here. And we also have a research facility in Cordoba, Spain. We're open to answer any questions anytime. Thank you very much. Sure, I think we have a few minutes. Yep. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah, the first question is a very good question, and I've been asked that many times, and I think your answer is, part of your answer is right, is that it's been studied the most. So as we learn more about some of these other, other molecules, we'll probably find that there are other health benefits to those molecules as well. It seems, though, that because of the mechanisms, they, they just, as I mentioned early on, it's hard to catch everything, but CBD does not technically bind to either of the two receptors, so it has a much broader activity in the endocannabinoid system, whereas a lot of these other molecules just bind to CB2 or just bind to CB1, so they might have less effects from a health perspective. But, so I think it's a combination of those two things. To your second question, Emerald Health Therapeutics, I'm going to let Bernie, he's our Vice President of Communications. and Yeah, it, it is, and, and it's gone up quite a bit in just the last couple of days, but Bernie, you want to take that one? Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks for your time and your interest. Uh, Bernie Hertel. I'm responsible for communications with um, this group of companies. Um, glad that you're an observer of the company already. Um, if you have been following this space, you know that the whole Canadian sector moved up dramatically through the fall in anticipation of legalization uh, occurring in 2018. So originally, the Canadian government had said they were aiming for July 1st. So you, know, you guys are all smart investors. You know, not everybody in the world comes and spends time in an event like this. And you know that uh, markets will anticipate key events when they're visible. And it's often, say, a six to nine month time frame. So sure enough, in the fall, six to nine months, sure enough, the market starts moving up. Uh, around November, you had uh, Constellation making its first investment in Canopy, really helped to provide some additional validation moved it along further. So the market peaked out in, in January. The whole sector had moved. I mean, bigger companies moved more perhaps, but everybody moved in lockstep more or less. And then, as you all know, markets don't just continue to go up. So a consolidation started, and that's usually going to be something that occurs over some number of months. So the consolidation started occurring uh, for the whole sector was pretty much about a 50% pullback, which is not unusual when you have a consolidation in a stock chart, right? if you're into technical analysis. 50%, the whole sector. And uh, consolidation occurred, and, uh, and then as we were starting getting closer to, so then it started becoming clear that maybe the legalization wasn't going to occur by July 1st, but then the Senate, the Canadian Senate was taking its steps. It became clear that it was moving forward, and uh, some of the key companies then started to move up uh, in, say, the March, April time frame. Uh, legalization was solidified, it was finalized in May. The event of sales starting for re recreationally does not occur till October 17th, but the legalization part of it, the legislation, was in place by, by the end of May. Emerald did not move up at that point uh, you know, so much uh, with the, uh, the rest of the sector because you know, we made a strategic decision uh, well, you know, a couple of years ago already, to not expose uh, investor capital unnec to unnecessary risk. Uh, prior to knowing what the federal government's plans actually were. And that actual plan didn't become clear until about April of 2017. So we started on some of our activities a little bit later, and then we hit it hard. We put in, the, in place this major joint venture to grow, uh, to cultivate last year, and it's coming on stream really well. It's going to be one of the most rapidly ramping facilities out there. Um, but we weren't perceived as necessarily being the biggest player, so we didn't move up in that last upward move. And then we had a little hiccup, and this is... Um, uh, okay, time's up. So the conclusion is simply this. We, we did not have a supply agreement in place when the BC government announced uh, uh, supply agreements being provided to 31 different licensed producers uh, about a month ago, five weeks ago. And if you want to see classic examples of, uh, of lemming effect and what I call chicken little uh, syndrome, 
Um, this was one of those scenarios. The mar some people, there was some misinformation, and people started thinking, you guys are a bunch of morons, you're incompetent. I mean, if you look at the team of people, that, that could be further from the truth. We elected not to um, take the first agreement that was offered to us, the pricing and so on, with the BC government, because they were being very aggressive. And in fact, only a week later, we announced an agreement that was very good, but of course, we had, there was some confidence broken in the market, and uh, so we consolidated down at these lows. Uh, but so that's the explanation as to why we've gone down. In the last week, we've, uh, we've announced, so in the last number of weeks, we've also announced a sales license. Uh, we just announced another amendment to our, our cultivation license to expand the growing space. All good things. And uh, we've probably almost doubled in the last week and a half. But we're still at relative lows. So Jim had shown some valuation figures. For what we have going and the life sciences perspective that we have even in that company, uh, I think it's an interesting company to be taking a look at. Thank you very much, everyone. With GW Pharma, though, they are just using CBD. Yeah, they're just using they're just using a, a special delivery that that can that can give it greater bioavailability. CBD, and that's a good question, and, and I don't I don't know the full answer to that, but part of it is because. Number one, they've refined their CBD so much that they know exactly what it targets, and, they, yes. and they've formulated it in a way so that it can be taken. And CBD, if you take the oil, is very little of it gets in the bloodstream. So this, a lot more gets into the bloodstream. And so much higher levels in the bloodstream. So that's one of the answers. Okay, good. And do you know products for CBD that specifically, because my friend said, I'll buy you some CBD oil at the moment. Well, CBD is one of the best things for sleep. The pure CBD is liquid, or yeah. you can use you can use. So you don't have a special product that you use. No. Okay, just the CBD. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Well, thank you for letting me understand because you know I'm I'm like I cut down as many.
Okay, you want to bring this up here or you want to run it from here? Um, up to the side of the trail. I'll turn it around so it sits right here. That way, if I'm up there, I will not Okay. Here's your remote trigger. Um, so all you gotta do is pull forward, backwards. You need a laser pointer right there. Forward, backwards, backwards. Can I just press anywhere and it'll pick yeah, it up? You should pick it up. We'll walk in front of the room. And then laser is the red light. Yep. Oh. Yeah. And then, and then here you go. I'm gonna, you're gonna be live right now because you are actually shivering. So put that in your pocket. Check on you. So the mic up there is still live. Is okay. it supposed to be or not? Uh, it's constantly on. It is, okay. But, yeah. It's okay. Yeah.
Oh, great, thank you. Jorge, nice Hi. to meet you. Nice to meet you. Well, thanks for coming by today. Oh, my pleasure. So the month recommendation is Newell? Uh, that was Newell from uh, yeah a few months ago. It's still, we think, a really good stock. Absolutely. Yeah. I bought Ford off your recommendation. Oh, you did? Okay. Um, I bought Ford the minute it went down below 10. Okay, good. I like so the recently 5%. Then. That's nice. That's yeah. part of your portfolio still, though. No? It, it is, yeah. Um, Ford has a lot of issues, but uh, we're still hanging in there with it. Does pay a nice dividend. And we What's think the big issue with Ford? I mean, it always trades between seven and fifteen, or you know. Seems like it. Well, we're about ready to start. Why don't we? You can ask the question, and we'll cover it then. Or I can, okay, I'll talk to you good. afterwards. Absolutely yeah. great. Thank you.
What's that? Okay, well, thank you for coming out uh, and staying late uh, this afternoon, I'm sure, on a uh, beautiful sunny afternoon here in, in San Francisco on a Saturday at uh, 3 15. There's there are a lot of other things competing with your time and interest. So I, uh, I appreciate you guys sticking around and, uh, and uh, hearing a little bit about we, how we look at stocks and, uh, uh, and hopefully asking some uh, good questions uh, afterwards. So today our topic is uh, using the law start of contrarian stock selection to find great long term stocks. Uh, I'm Bruce Kaser. I am the head of equity research and uh, the associate uh, editor of the Turnaround Letter, which is uh, one of the longest running uh, newsletters in the industry. We've been around since uh, 1986, founded by George Putnam, who uh, uh, runs the, uh, the Turnaround Letter and is also involved in a number of other uh, private businesses. Uh, what we do is we focus exclusively on turnaround stocks, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what, what that really means. Uh, we have a, we bring institutional quality independent research. All the research is ours. We source all our ideas from scratch. We do all the ind independent research on it. Uh, we are uh, the sole research uh, function of the group. Uh, and we have a little bit of a different uh, kind of format where uh, it's really a, kind of a buy side, sell side hybrid. You know, what does that really mean? Well, we recommend stocks on a one off basis. Every month we recommend a stock to buy. Uh, but then, like a real investment portfolio, we actually track that as if it was real money. And you can see all the ideas we recommended going back uh, 32 years, how they worked out, how they did not work out sometimes. And then we track that performance on a real-time basis, uh, audited by uh, the highly respected Holbert ratings. So you can see every name we recommend and how it works, uh, not just a select group of names, but every name we recommend. And so it's kind of like a real portfolio in terms of uh, how it performs and how you can monitor that. Um, and then our subscribers, uh, we have subscribers from around the world, pretty much all 50 states and uh, 25 other countries. And it's uh, individual investors, uh, investment advisors. We have some hedge funds and mutual fund managers, uh, sovereign wealth funds, which would be uh, country run investment uh, funds, and then uh, uh, a, a number of other investment funds around, around the world. And, Turnaround Letter is part of New Generation Research. Uh, New Generation Research is focused, focused exclusively on investments in companies that are either struggling or distressed or, uh, or in bankruptcy. And some of those tend to be more uh, bond focused. Uh, but that's our specialty, companies that are just not doing well or maybe have done poorly, uh, but looking for opportunities in that, uh, that universe. So stock picking. Uh, and we have copies of the slides. If you didn't happen to pick one up, we have copies of all these slides in the back, so uh, feel free to watch the presentation and uh, then get a hard copy in the back. You can uh, uh, take that with you. So stock picking, is it becoming a lost art? Well, it, it really is. Uh, a whole generation of investors have assumed that individual stock picking is, uh, is absolutely pointless. And uh, a number of reasons for that. One is that uh, the efficient market hypothesis, which came out of my school, the University of Chicago, uh, has uh, done some pretty good research over the years to say, well, for the most part, the market is efficient. Most stocks price in most of the information that's out there, and, and so most investors have taken the approach of, uh, of if the stock market is somewhat efficient or mostly efficient, then it's always efficient in all stocks at all times, and, and why bother picking out an individual stock? Uh, and a whole generation of, uh, of people have come up from uh, from school and from independent, uh, independent work and, and said, you know, it's just not worth it picking stocks. Uh, picking individual stocks, it takes time and, and effort. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, you know, it takes uh, going through some annual reports and financial statements and doing the math. It's, it's not easy necessarily, uh, and it does take a little bit of time. Uh, Short-term mindset. Uh, today, all we hear about is what's that company doing today? Uh, are they in the right place at the right time? Is everything going well? Uh, the next couple weeks, uh, how does the economic outlook appear today? Um, you know, the media talks about stocks that are working now. Jim Cramer sometimes will talk about the church of what's working today. Uh, it may not work tomorrow, but it's working today, so let's buy it. So that's kind of the mindset that a lot of uh, the market and media are, are putting out there. And so it, it's hard to take a long-term uh, perspective. And then volatility. Uh, 
again, the professional investment community has trained a whole generation of investors to say, well, well volatility is risk. If its stock moves up and down or, or gosh, God forbid, it goes down, well, that's volatility, that's risk, that's bad. Um, and we can see the effect of that over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. We all have seen this chart before or in some variation. Uh, index mutual funds and ETFs have really taken over. All of the money flows, active money has, uh, has come out of the market. And in terms of the U.S. market today, uh, the mix is actually about 50-50 in terms of what's actively managed and what's indexed. So stock picking is becoming really a, a lost art. Uh, for many people, a simple ETF approach might actually be the right thing. Uh, for investors who want uh, a broad market exposure to maybe the S&P 500 or some global uh, index, uh, that might provide absolutely what they need. The fees can be very low. I think Fidelity came out the other day with, with a zero fee uh, ETF. You can't get any lower than that. And uh, yeah, it requires very little time and effort. Kind of set it, forget it. You do it in one trade, you're done. And, uh, and that's really all it takes. And that may be the exact right approach for, for many, many people. But it's not without flaws, and it's not really for everybody. Uh, ETFs own every stock at an index, regardless of the investment merit. Uh, I think some of the speakers today have talked about index investing being really momentum investing, you know, buying high and then selling low. Uh, ETFs can be very concentrated in the S&P 500 uh, almost a tenth of the portfolio, if it were uh, an independent portfolio, would be in Apple, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Alphabet, which is Google. Uh, if a lot of people said, gosh, I'm going to put a tenth of your portfolio in those four names, uh, a lot of people might say, gosh, that's, that's a lot to be in those names. So it's, it's a lot more concentrated than it may sound. And even a lot of sophisticated investors, you really have no idea what's in their ETFs. Uh, in the Russell 2000 index, which is an index that covers a small cap stocks, uh, earlier this summer, 10% of the index was in a company called Nectar uh, Pharmaceuticals. And that was a pretty obscure company that happened to grow pretty quickly. But it got cut in half when they had some uh, patent problems. And, and again, if somebody said, gosh, I'm going to put a tenth of your portfolio in a biotech company that could get cut in half, I think a lot of people might say, that's, that's maybe not what I'm looking for. And it can lull investors into a sense of complacency about volatility and returns. And... Uh, and what we focus on is at least potentially outsized returns on the table. Uh, you're buying the market, you get it, and that's all you're going to get. We think the art is not totally lost. We think that it's really a craft. It's not a manufacturing or industrialized process like an ETF or like one of the large mutual fund shops might put together. It's a specialized niche. It does require developing tools and methods. It requires a process that is repeatable. You do it over and over and over again. Uh, it's flexible within that niche to create new ideas and develop and then also uh, always be learning. So the turnaround letters niche, uh, we'll get into uh, a lot of this uh, coming up next is we focus exclusively on out of favor stocks that are ready for turnarounds. Uh, our holding period is in eternity sometimes compared to the market. Uh, two to four years is not uncommon for us. Uh, we've held stocks a little bit longer than that even, uh, but we'll hold a stock for as long as it takes for the thesis to work or if on a long-term basis it just is not going to work, uh, we'll wait that out, but ultimately uh, we will get out of stocks that, that don't work. We look for stocks that have strong potential. Uh, if a stock has a 10 or 20% potential, that's not really of interest to us. We want to look at stocks that have meaningful upside, 50% to 100% over that two to four year period. Many of our stocks go much higher than that, but that's the range we're shooting for. Uh, we look at stocks across the market cap, large, mid cap, small, uh, all industries, all sectors. Uh, we look outside the United States at developed country uh, large cap stocks. We don't do any ETFs, fixed income, options, commodities, or currencies. So it's just on stocks and just turnaround stocks. So let's talk a little bit about what is it that we do as contrarian investors picking, picking stocks. So this is a part I think that's very different from a lot of the other methods you've heard today. Uh, ours is one that can be complementary to theirs. It can be uh, one you can use in, in many different ways, and, and a lot of methods work really well. This is what we have found uh, to be our approach. Uh, so contrarian stocks, they have something wrong with them. Something clearly is not working with one of these contrarian companies. Uh, the revenues aren't growing. The margins are shrinking. Maybe they've done an acquisition that has failed. Uh, maybe they have come out of bankruptcy, so they carry the, the taint of bankruptcy. Uh, they may have a temporary or 
unnerving problem. Uh, maybe they have uninspiring or perhaps dour near-term prospects. And generally, the narrative is, is awful. Somebody might say, gosh, I think this stock looks interesting, and you'll just go, oh my gosh, that, that, that's an awful story. Why would I want to buy that stock? And investors stay away. These stocks are unpopular, and they're uncomfortable to own. We think the investing universe for truly out-of-favor stocks is about 10 to 20% of the investing universe. And when we think about value investing, we don't necessarily think of what most people think uh, of value investing, oh, banks or oil companies. We think value investing is really looking at these stocks that are out of favor that investors just don't want. So that's what we start with, stocks that are really out of favor. Now this is an example of two different stocks. And you might ask yourself, well, well which one would you be more comfortable owning? Stock A, nice upward chart, very steady, or stock B, which looked like it was going to do OK and then had several very sharp downturns and just continue to weaken. I know most people would say, gosh, this, this chart on the left looks, looks great. That's the one I want to buy. And that's the one that a lot of the media and a lot, a lot of other uh, investors will look at and say, that's, that's what I want. Our stock is the one on the right. This is what we look for. Not just a stock that's flat, but a stock that is awful. You look at it and you say, gosh, I, I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. But that's really where our edge is. It's in stocks that are really out of favor like that. Now, what, you wouldn't want to just buy any out of favor stock because, in, because frankly, most out of favor stocks, they're just not ever going to work. Something truly is wrong with a company. It's not going to recover. Not every stock really is something we want to focus on. What we want to look for is a stock that has something that's going to make it a more valuable company. Some catalyst that says, well, the downturn in the fundamentals is not so good, but it's not going to be that way forever, and, and here's a couple reasons why. So with the right catalyst, one that's powerful enough to turn around the company's prospects, that's what we want to look for. The first one, new management, that's one of the most powerful catalysts that we have ever seen, uh, that we find it. And one is that uh, when you think about a company, a company really is just a collection of assets. There are a lot of people, it might be some machinery or it might be some technology, it might be a brand name that everybody feels comfortable buying. Uh, it might be some property. It's really just a, a collection of assets that a management's job is to make sure they're using those assets in the right way. And so if a management team has not used all those uh, assets in the right way, the company's not going to do very well. You bring in a new management, they look at things in a very different way. They may look at a business or a segment and say, you know, that really doesn't belong in this company. Let's get rid of it. So new management is one of the most powerful catalysts that we see for turning around a struggling company. Sometimes a credible outside shareholder exerting pressure is what's needed. Uh, often we hear about those people that are called activists or activist investors. Uh, some are better than others. Some are really, really good. Uh, some are really good, but they're not always good on every stock. But we find that to be a pretty good catalyst for uh, turning around a company. Another one is a company that's coming out of bankruptcy. Companies that come out of bankruptcy often be really good invest investments. Uh, if it's a good company that had a bad balance sheet, when a company comes out of bankruptcy, that balance sheet can be cleaned up a lot. So now we have a good company with a good balance sheet that investors are ignoring because it's a bankrupt company, I think, or it was in bankruptcy, I don't remember, but I don't want to touch it now until it becomes a great company again. Sometimes uh, a spin-off transaction can deliver fantastic value. Uh, a spin-off is a division or a subsidiary of a company that the parent company decides we're going to give that company to the shareholders so instead of having you know, one share of the, the whole company, you might have a share of the whole company and then a smaller you know, one share of this other division that's now independent. Well, that can be a really valuable catalyst because now it's a smaller company focused only on its needs and it can allocate you know, its capital, its time, and its energy just on what it needs and not maybe send capital or cash or attention up to the parent company. It does what it, it should do. Or maybe it's a company that has uh, a cyclical upturn, it's been out of favor because the industry is not working very well, pricing is weak or too much capacity. So sometimes those can be really good catalysts. And what we look for then is uh, the list of catalysts. We track all the catalysts that we can find. Uh, there might be 60 to 90 catalysts every month. Uh, we actually have a report uh, that shows these catalysts. Uh, 
we think this is something that we, we look at very closely. We want to know what all the catalysts are for all the companies that, that have them in any given month. So what do we do with this? Uh, companies with real value selling at significant discounts and have an imminent company changing catalyst to turn around the prospects, that's where the opportunity is. So you have out of favor stocks like that chart that was going down. We have a catalyst and we look at the opportunity right at the intersection here. That's where we want to find stocks not just out of favor, or not just ones with catalysts, but we want to find the ones that are in that intersection. And in a market that is fairly efficient, where most stocks, for the most part, are priced pretty much about right, this is a very inefficient niche. It's inefficient in the sense that people avoid it for, in many ways, unnecessary reasons, for fear or uh, concern that the stock's going to continue to go down, or or in many cases, just lack of attention. A lot of these stocks do not get very good attention on Wall Street, and it offers stocks at a, a value at a price that's lower than it should be. So that's where the opportunity is, and that's what we look for. Um, uh, another source of you know, kind of inefficiency, I guess, is, uh, is time. Uh, most investors don't want to buy stocks that have been out there or that have a two to three year turnaround horizon. If it doesn't look great today, most investors say, no thanks, I'll, I'll wait till it gets better, uh, and, then, and then acquire by the stock. Once we've found stocks in that intersection, that's where our work really begins. Uh, there are a lot of stocks that might meet that criteria, but for us, we want to know, is this really going to work? So we do a lot of fundamental research, looking at financial statements, the websites, stuff that's available on the internet. By the way, all this stuff is free. We don't pay research services for anything. Uh, everything that's on here is available to everybody in the public. Every company publishes its, um, uh, its financial statements, all of its presentations. It's all free on the website. Conference calls, which uh, follow a company's earnings report, they'll talk to analysts. Uh, Seeking Alpha actually provides those conference call transcripts for free. Uh, field research, uh, one of the stocks we like is Macy's. So. I uh, saw the Union Square Macy's out here. It's a pretty impressive store. The one in New York City, uh, I looked at that when I was out there. Uh, we have a number of Macy's in our area. Um, we do our own field research. We look at it to the extent we can and see if the story makes sense to us. Uh, trade associations, media, and other resources, there's a lot of resources that cover a lot of stocks, so we, we try to keep up with those. On the right side lists some of the detailed checklist items we look for. And Developing an understanding of the company and the turnaround, that's something that we really want to make sure we understand. One of the traits we look for, which kind of seems crazy in a short-term world like ours, is we look at the company's history. We look at when it was founded, why it was founded. Uh, some companies were founded 80, 90 years ago. We go all the way back to the founding and track the company over time to understand how did it get to where it is today so we can put today's situation in some kind of context. And we'll cover a little bit about the importance of that when you look at a co company we recommend a little bit later. So we want to understand the company and its turnaround. Uh, a lot of that is some of these qualitative measures. We want to understand what management's doing and who's on the board of directors. We want to look at the turnaround strategy that may be uh, discussed. Uh, we want to look at the industry and its competition, and then any other external pressures that might affect uh, the company's turnaround. We'll also look at the balance sheet. We think the balance sheet is one of the most ignored parts of researching companies. People look at the income statement, that's great, but problems on the, income, problems on the balance sheet, uh, we have found migrate one way or the other to the income statement. Whereas strength in the balance sheet, we eventually migrate to strengthen the income statement. So we look at the balance sheet, and really what we're looking for there is um, the amount of debt the company has relative to its ability to produce cash to pay off that debt. And then free cash flow, that's really just how much money the company has at the end of the, end of the day produces uh, cash from its operations, got to pay taxes, got to pay interest. It, uh, it needs to buy equipment, capital spending. Uh, we want to know how much, company, how much cash the company has left at, at the end of the day. Uh, we like companies with a lot of cash. Uh, we think that's probably the second most underrated aspect of a company is the amount of cash that it'll, it just accumulates day in, day out, year in, year out. Um, you know, the Wall Street brokerage community really ignores that. And so we, uh, we want to focus on that a lot. We look at revenue stability, the existing assets that it has, the financial flexibility. We want to understand the numbers behind a company. And then uh, that helps us quantify the impact of the turnaround. 
What we look for when we do a turnaround is we take the current position of the company, we project forward uh, two, three, four years to see what the company will look like if this turnaround works. And if a turnaround works, then we can put numbers on it and say, well, in the year 2021, it'll have roughly this amount of revenue, this amount of profits, the balance sheet will look like this. Uh, we think we can put a certain multiple on the earnings. And so that allows us to both uh, track where we think it will go, put a price target on it, and it will also help us understand where the company is going along the way. If we're going to hold a stock for two or three years or four years, we want to be able to measure the progress along that path and then uh, understand if it's making progress or where it maybe isn't uh, quite keeping up yet. And so the assessing the end of the end of scenario, share price potential and the risks, that's where that comes in. We want to know what will this thing look like in two or three or four years once a turnaround is complete and then how do we, how do we price that? And then we'll recommend the idea and then put it on our list of uh, recommended companies. In terms of potential outcome, uh, you know, how will this turn out? If our company turns around, well, well how do we get paid? Well, most of the time, you know, we get paid based on market recognition. The market sees a turnaround, it sees that the balance sheet is stronger, it sees that the earnings are stronger and higher, and it will reward that with a higher multiple on those earnings. And that's really the most common way that, that we sell a company is the market recognizes something that we recognized two or three years earlier, stock goes up quite a bit, and then we, we get our gain out of that. In some cases, the company may be broken up or may go private uh, or may be taken over by another company um, and, and some other reasons. But we want to look at that. We want to look at why this thing will work and what happens if, if it does work, how will, it, how will it all play out. So we're really looking out into the future. Uh, notice one thing we did not talk about here. Uh, nowhere on here will you see what's our outlook for the economy, what's our outlook for interest rates, uh, what's our outlook for the political situation in Washington or, or elsewhere. Uh, what's our outlook for uh, a number of different variables, currencies, uh, commodity prices? We don't, we don't look at any of those macro pictures. We certainly want to be macro aware. We want to have a sense of what, what season we're in. Is it, is it summer? Is it winter? Right now, the economy is in summer. Everything's green. It's growing great. Everything's just fantastic. Um, in 2009, it was you know, the dead of winter. We certainly want to know what, what the climate is, what the seasons are. But we don't want to watch the day-to-day. -day. It's just not something we focus on. All our companies will turn around based on their own work inside the company, uh, not so much on the macro environment. So being selective is critical. Uh, not every turnaround story will work. Not every catalyst will work. Not every out-of-favor company will turn around. So we spend a lot of time making sure we pick really just the best ones that, uh, that we see. So, the ideal candidate over on the, the left side and then the weak candidate on the right, you can see some of these are just mirror images of each other, but we certainly like to see uh, a great leadership, a credible plan. Uh, yes? Are you kids, are you actually talking to the management? Usually we do not. Um, sometimes we will, but for the most part we don't. Uh, we do hear from managements on their, their conference calls. Uh, but very rarely will, will they give us access. Uh, they usually talk only to large shareholders or uh, at conferences they might talk to a number of shareholders um, and they'll certainly talk to the major sell side brokerage firms. How can uh, you make the determination of other, whether or not their plan is credible? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So we look at a couple of different things. One is we look at is management credible? Uh, what have they done at other firms they've been at? Uh, do they have the right background? Um, if the company's problems are operations, uh, the margins are too weak because they haven't run the company well, it's inefficient, they have a lot of costs, uh, what we want to see is a management that has the ability to do that. What is their background? Uh, are they engineers? Um, some of our companies have uh, people from Pepsi. Uh, Pepsi is one of the most uh, amazingly well-run companies. Uh, they take millions and millions of bottles of soda and other drinks and process them, put them through a distribution channel, and are very, very good at doing that at a very low cost. So if a company's problems are operational, and they're bringing in a couple people from Pepsi, for example, well, we like that. Uh, is the plan credible? Well, a lot of it is, uh, uh, one, does it, have they shown the detail work? Uh, have they outlined what they think they can do based on reasonable assumptions? 
Um, if they think they can increase the, the operating margins, we look at how are those margins compared to similar companies. Um, one company that we, uh, we looked at and, and liked and uh, recommended a while ago was Advanced Auto Parts. Uh, Advanced Auto Parts is a distributor of used car parts, well, car parts for cars. Uh, some new, mostly for uh, repair. And their operating margins were half of um, AutoZone and uh, you know, their other competitor. So we thought it was pretty credible if they said, gosh, we can raise our margins from 10% uh, to 12% when other companies in the same industry are around 18 to 19%. So we thought that was credible. If they said, well, we're going to uh, take our sales growth and and go from a 2% sales growth rate to a 10% sales growth rate, we would look at that as being not credible. The industry is mature, a lot of tough competition, that's just not credible. So a lot of it comes from looking at the company situation, who the experts are, and really using some of our judgment based on our experience with the industry. Uh, relevant products, they need to have a product that people want to buy, stable or growing industry, uh, generating a lot of free cash flow, a lot of these traits over here would make an ideal candidate. No company has all of those. If they did, it'd be an amazing investment. So we try to pick out ones that we think are most important. And really, the top two or three really are some of the most important ones that, uh, that we want to find. And then this is the weak candidate. And this is often what you'll hear when you hear about a, you know, a narrative or story about a company. Oh, they have awful leadership. Uh, the products aren't any good. Uh, they're burning cash. They're overpriced. Uh, those are stocks we want to avoid as well because they don't have really the ingredients that we want. So when we're buying a stock, we look at it as if we're buying the entire company, not just a ticker or not just a couple shares. We look at it as if we're buying the whole company, and we cannot sell it for two or three years. So that helps us think more clearly about what traits does it have and, and do they really have those traits? Because if we don't want to touch it for two or three years, we're relying on the management and the company to make its turnaround without trading in and out or, or getting out early. So our list of stocks that we recommend are, are very different from the broad market. Uh, our recommendation, we have 48 stocks right now. S&P 500 is 505. They have a couple companies in there that uh, are sort of split, like Google. Uh, mostly US companies, some non-US. Our stocks tend to be a little bit on the smaller side. And what's interesting, too, is also the, the, uh, the sectors that we're in, very, very different from the S&P 500. Our biggest group is the consumer discretionary stocks. And, and these might be for reasons that you'd expect. We want to find a company that we can understand if they're making products that we might buy in a, in a store or, or maybe the store itself. It's something we can literally go to. We can see it. We understand what they're making. Not a lot of uh, you know, complications there. So we can understand the product. We can understand what the business is. And then uh, the other two is that in some ways, Consumer discretionary stocks are ones that are, are fixable. Uh, consumers are uh, creatures of habit. Uh, in many cases, uh, the only reason people stop going to a company uh, or a store is that the company is so poorly run they, they literally will scare customers away. But we found that customers are pretty loyal and they'll just want to go back and do the same, same thing over and over again so it creates a little bit of stability and brand value that can be recovered if a company turns around. Uh, industrials. What's fascinating about industrial companies is they make products that generally are uh, obviously in demand and that uh, in most cases there are not, there's not a lot of competition. Um, if, uh, you know, if you buy breakfast cereal, uh, there's what, two aisles full of breakfast cereal, maybe 100 different kinds of breakfast cereal, but if you buy a widget for an aircraft, there might be only two or three companies that make that. And so the margins tend to be higher there aren't any substitutes. If you don't like that company's widget and you don't like the other substitute, there are no other choices. So these companies tend to be, uh, in some cases, better run. They tend to have more stable products and they're, they're fixable because their customers need them to fix that product and company so they have a reliable source. And then energy, uh, energy's an industry right now, it's pretty out of favor, so we have, a lot of ener we have several energy stocks. Um, what's interesting about this group here is is technology. We have very few technology stocks. Uh, technology is complicated. Uh, I'm not a technology guy, so a lot of the stuff I have no idea what they really do. Um, the assets in a technology company are, are in, intangible. Uh, cloud companies, you can't get more intangible than a cloud. So we tend not to have a lot of technology companies. 
And another thing about technology companies is if they have the right technology, they are spot on. Nobody can get enough of their products. People are buying a lot of them. Uh, they probably might, they might even have a monopoly or close to a monopoly in that product. And those are the stocks that you see that are just absolutely taking off. Um, so two problems with technology from a contrarian perspective. One is we can't understand what they do for the most part. Uh, second is uh, if they're in the sweet spot, their stocks are priced out of what we like to, like to see. They're not really turnarounds. And I guess maybe a third reason is once a company loses its technology edge, it's over. Our view is it's very, very difficult for a technology company that has fallen out of favor because products aren't any good to turn that around and come back in favor. Occasionally, companies like, uh, like Micron or AMD that make uh, semiconductor chips can come back in favor if there's few competitors and uh, they decide, they figure out how to fix their problems. But for the most part, uh, especially for software, uh, technology is just an area where if they're out of favor, it's, it's over. Um, healthcare, uh, we have some healthcare companies, but again, that's an area that has a lot of, uh, a lot of government regulations that we certainly can't understand. Uh, and the pricing tends to be a little obscure. And while the area as a part of the economy continues to grow rapidly, we found it to be a, a tough area in general for, for turnarounds. We do have some in that area, but in general, it's not, not one of the more fertile grounds for us. So uh, looking for turnarounds, really sort of looking at the world from the, the total opposite end of the spectrum. And, and because it's so counterintuitive, we think that's, really, that's what, uh, what drives the, uh, the niche. And then, you know, does this work? I mean, I, I'm up here talking about these great ideas and great strategies. It all sounds good, but does it, does it really work? And this is, again, tracked by um, Mark Holbert of Holbert Ratings. So this is all independently verified. Uh, so far, it's working. Uh, this year, we've had a pretty good year, uh, one, three, five. Uh, but we like to, we're pride, we look at the, the 10 and 20 year record. That's what kind of really tells us, hey, we're, we're doing all right here. Uh, over a lot of different economic environments and, and stock market environments, uh, this strategy has worked out pretty well. Um, as they say, past performance is no guarantee of future returns. Uh, sometimes it's not even uh, indicative of future returns. Uh, but so far, it's working pretty well. And uh, our record uh, goes back over a number of years. So uh, um, we think we've found something that seems to work uh, pretty well. So I'll talk a little bit about two stocks that we recommended and we've sold. And then I'll talk about one that uh, we're currently recommending right now. Uh, FTI Consulting. Uh, FTI Consulting is a, uh, a consulting firm like the name uh, describes. Uh, they are specialists in things that companies have to work on, but it's outside the normal line of business. If a company has uh, uh, an activist investor, if a company is being sued uh, by a, uh, uh, for a major problem, if a company has uh, some operational restructuring issues, uh, if a company has a uh, a media problem. Anything that is troubling a company that is outside their area of uh, their normal day-to-day -day business, uh, FTI Consulting does it. We looked at the stock uh, back in January 2015 and saw some really interesting things going on. The company was terribly out of favor. The stock had not done well for a while. Uh, they got a new CEO back in 2014 and we thought that was pretty interesting because it looked like he knew what he was doing and over time, he'd be able to turn the company around and fix some of the, the problems that, uh, that they were having. Uh, one of the issues that they had was uh, being a company really of people uh, and people who work there full time, you need to make sure they're working on projects. And they really didn't understand how to do that very well. So they had a lot of their employees, very talented, very capable people, but they weren't working. They were just sitting around waiting for projects. Well, that's pretty expensive. Uh, and they had a number of other issues and, and it took this company really three years, uh, well two years, to kind of figure it out. And during this time period, the stock market did this, it went up. Uh, this company's stock did nothing. And in two cases here, the stock had a sharp drop and there it had a sharp drop. And a lot of investors were scared out. It's not working, we're out of here was kind of the attitude. We hung in and this is where patience is so critical. We had a scenario laid out about how far we think the company's earnings could increase. And over four consecutive quarters, the stock went from really just a complete dog to really an exceptional stock. And 
in this case, all the return, perhaps even more than all the return, because it started from a lower point, was all in this last period here, you know, almost three years, uh, actually three years away from when we purchased it. So patience is so critical. Uh, for an investor who got shaken out here or here, you know, they maybe had no gain, but they left this tremendous gain here uh, on, the, on the table. So this stock had a 96% return, and that was uh, three times or, or more what the stock market did over that period. And then another one is, is bioveritive. Um, I, I'm not a biotech expert. I don't really know what these molecules are that most of these companies do. But this company was interesting because it was part of uh, Biogen, the giant pharmaceutical company, and it was really outside their core strategy. Uh, Bioveritive was a division that made uh, drugs for uh, treatments for hemophilia, which is the uh, ailment that a lot of young boys have. It's uh, from birth, and it prevents their blood from clotting. And so you can imagine, uh, for some reason, it, it affects boys more than, than girls. But if, if a young person starts bleeding from just a routine scratch, they could actually bleed out and die from that. And that's a pretty serious problem. And historically, the treatment was a, a daily treatment. Now, if you're a young kid, you don't want to go to the doctor every day for some really crazy treatment. So they came up with a treatment that was uh, once every two, three, four days. Well, this was such a tremendous improvement in the living standards of, uh, of uh, people with hemophilia that their product quickly became a, a billion dollar product, a billion dollars in revenue. That's amazing. Uh, Biogen did not want them, spun them out as an independent company back in uh, early 2017. Uh, we looked at it and said, they have a product that's really in demand, and there's not really a lot of competition for it, so the revenue is stable, and there's a real demand for it. Uh, they had almost no debt, so all the money that they earned flowed straight through the shareholders. They did not have to pay any debt off. They generated enormous cash flow because all the research and development had been completed, so all they had to do is create some incremental development, uh, but again, most of the profits from the product straight to the bottom line. And the management looked pretty good, so a lot of the ingredients fell in place, and we looked at it and recommended it back in 2017, a little more than a year ago, uh, just after the IPO. Well, what's fascinating about this is I talked to some other biotech people in Boston, and they were like, well, BioVeritive, what do they do? Uh, I haven't heard of them before. Uh, doesn't seem like anything we're interested in. I was really surprised because I'm not a biotech guy, but here's some biotech people really dismissing this company. I was really surprised by that. And it actually encouraged me more. Uh, I thought maybe we're on to something. Well, is that a true turnaround? Yeah, so these are all stocks we recommended. Uh, they're on our. I mean, but you said they had the cash, uh, nice cash flow. They, had, they were making money. Right. What is the turnaround? So in this case, uh, it was a contrarian stock that investors did not want. It didn't even need a turnaround, but because it was a spin-off, investors had looked at it and said, no, I, I'm not interested. So this wasn't necessarily a turnaround, you're right, uh, but it was a contrarian stock that the market had really dismissed, and we thought there was tremendous potential in it. Um, so market ignored it. Sanofi, a European drug company, said, no, actually, this is a tremendous stock, and they acquired it uh, earlier this year for $103 a share. Uh, this was a price that we thought it'd be worth maybe $80 a share. So uh, in this case, a spinoff, which was a out of favor company uh, that had a real catalyst, uh, turned out to be a pretty, pretty good stock. Um, I'm not sure if I'll ever recommend another biotech stock, but this one had a lot of traits to it that were, uh, were pretty appealing and uh, it worked out okay. So in, in spinoffs, sometimes there's some real, uh, real gems out there. Um, so this is the company we currently recommend right now. This is Newell. Um, it's about, uh, I think, $13 billion in, in market cap. Uh, we've all seen their products. Everybody uses Sharpie pens. Uh, some of us have Crock-Pots or Mr. Coffee. Uh, they have uh, one of their brands is Coleman, outdoor gear, camping equipment, so forth. Um, they also make, uh, they have a Rubbermaid brand, Graco. They have a whole smattering of products. and. Uh, the history of the company, it was founded in, uh, in the early 1900s, over 100 years ago, by, uh, uh, by a guy named Newell, and they just built the business over really 80 years with common household products. And this was a darling of the stock market until 1999. Their thing was buy companies, integrate them really well, cut costs. Uh, this was one of the most popular stocks going into 1999. Then they acquired Rubbermaid, 
and, and the wheels really fell off this company. Uh, and over the next 20 years, the stock went nowhere, the earnings per share went nowhere, the share count tripled, the debt went up 11-fold, and revenues went up. But they ended up with really just a, a mess of, of uh, companies and products that really just were not put together well. What really hurt the company more recently is back in 2016, they bought a company called Jarden. Jarden was a really well-run uh, company that had a lot of household products, Rawlings, baseball gear, and among others. Um, they acquired this company that had $10 billion in revenue, and they spent almost $20 billion for it. That was just a ridiculous acquisition. And ever since then, it's been downhill. Fundamentals are not going well. Uh, revenue is shrinking. Uh, it really was just beyond their ability to integrate these companies and run them well. So here we have a company that is just not doing well at all. So what makes this attractive? One, obviously, it's out of favor. Second is, we think there's some pretty interesting catalysts to this company. Uh, the catalyst right now is that it's overseen by Starboard Value, which is an activist investor, and Carl Icahn. We all know who Carl Icahn is. Some people like him, some people don't. Uh, I'm not sure how I feel about him. He's done real well, so maybe there's something there. Uh, for himself. It's, that's absolutely true. Um, what we like about Starboard is that their thing is working with managements or replacing them as needed to fix companies that are run poorly, uh, companies that have bloated cost structures, companies that have products that really don't make any sense, uh, companies that are spread out all over and don't really have any way to integrate or run their business better. That's exactly what Newell is. Newell is a collection of products and, and divisions that do not work well together and is really just a complete mess, frankly. Um, weak execution, uh, investors look at their poor quarterly results. Um, and after we recommended the stock, it did have a pretty lousy quarter, so it's now even more out of favor than it was. Uh, the wheels are not going well for this company at all, but it has new management, uh, activists who are watching it very closely, and they have a plan to sell off a third of the business run the other two-thirds of the business more clearly, um, more efficiently, and then take all the cash that they've earned from selling their other businesses to buy back shares and pay down debt. So we like their plan. It looks pretty good on the numbers. It looks pretty good from a uh, qualitative perspective. Um, one thing we think is going to probably happen is the, the CEO who's been there for several years who was involved in a lot of these acquisitions, we think he's on the hot seat. We don't know how long he's going to be there. Um, but we think there's a real opportunity if they do change that to uh, accelerate the turnaround in the company. So out of favor, some tremendous catalysts. They generate a lot of cash flow. And uh, accretion of value, that's just really the cash buildup in the company that we use to pay down debt. And any dollar that goes to pay down debt, that's really money that goes in the, into the shareholders' pockets. So we think this looks pretty interesting. Uh, it is one of our more recent recommendations. And uh, it's an example of a stock that most people look at it and go, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, but we think there's real value there, and that's what has created the opportunity. Uh, a couple of quick things here. I think we're running out of time a little bit. So risks in contrarian investing can be high. They don't always work. If they don't work, sometimes the downside can be pretty large. And the other is uh, diversification is critical. You don't want to buy just one or two. You want to buy several of these, and you want to diversify a little bit by industry, you want to diversify by uh, kind of where they are in the turnaround cycle. Uh, if you buy all companies that are at the early stages, some of our stocks, they'll go down 50% before they go on to uh, have their, sh their, their sharp gains. So you want to have some companies that are in the early stages, some in the middle stages, some in the late stages, and that way they'll, the whole portfolio won't move, uh, move as one. And then we list a couple of uh, turnaround mistakes that are, are pretty common. Um, they're in the handout, so you can look at those later. Then just kind of boiling it down, uh, what are the key things to remember? Patience is critical. There's so much noise in the market. Ignore it. Just ignore it and focus on the long-term picture. Know the valuation. Uh, why is the stock uh, going to go to $30 or $49 a share? Know the numbers behind it. Uh, don't just follow the narrative. Follow the numbers. Uh, be picky. Uh, choose only the best of the few. Know the management and then uh, and diversify. So those are the, that's kind of what we do. Um, and uh, we have some time for questions. Any, any questions? Yeah. What's the story behind Ford? Right, right. 
So Ford is a stock that we've had on the recommended list for quite some time, and it is clearly struggling. Um, it dipped under you know, $10 a share, I think, as you know. Um, the fundamental problem with Ford uh, is that uh, two things. One is investors view Ford as not being part of the future. Uh, they do not have a tremendous uh, uh, edge in autonomous cars, self-driving cars. Uh, generally, car technology, is, they're pretty far behind on it. Um, and then the other is uh, there's a little bit of a lack of confidence in the new leadership. Um, the new leadership came from Steelcase, which is a maker of office equipment. Um, there's a lot of doubts as to whether he's, he's the right guy or not. Um, the Ford family depends on those dividends, so I would be very surprised if it cut the dividend, which I think is over 5% yield now. Um, so there's a lot of question about whether their turnaround is going to work or not. Uh, we're hanging in there, but it's, it's one of the ones where we're, we're a little nervous on. Really? Uh, we're, not, we're not giving up on it, but it's, it's been a little bit of a struggle. So but we're hanging in there on it. Are you looking at GE? Um, yeah, GE is a stock that we think has uh, a lot of potential. Um, it's, uh, it, it has a lot of trouble. It, it's got a lot of trouble on it. Um, their, their turnaround is still two years away or more. Um, so that's, that's one that definitely fits the, fits the bill. Do you recommend stocks? I'm sorry? Oh, uh, we will sell. Um, most of our sales are because a turnaround has worked. Um, we will recommend selling if, uh, if a company has become permanently impaired, uh, if the value is just not going to be there. What we often will do is just lower the price target on it because we'll take into consideration what has happened so far. Um, but uh, we'll do, we do recommend sales occasionally, but, but not, not very often. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you. Appreciate your time and staying around. Uh, there are copies of the slides in the back, which have other information about the company and, and the turnaround letter. And again, thanks for coming out today. Appreciate your guys uh, being here.